Everybody say it. Amen. Give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. If you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. And while you're turning, I want to say we're going to be doing a baptismal service. Immediately follow my sermon, I'll tell you when to get ready. Who I was going to be baptized? Yeah, my sister, thank God for you. Thank God for you two back there. Praise God for y'all. Give them a hand clap. And it was so sweet. I ran into her at Walmart, and she said, Pastor, i got to be at work at one, so can I go first? You better believe you can. I think it's awesome when somebody's got to be at work at one, they say, hey, I'm still getting baptized. And thank God for you. Thank God for all of you. And we're going to have a great service today. Also, my man Ron is sitting beside somebody who just had a birthday. Zach turned 14. Give Zach a hand clap. And little Remy, Jamie, stand up with little Remy. We celebrated her one-year birthday party. Can you give God a praise? A year ago, she was in the hospital, and now look how pretty, healthy, and happy that little baby is. God is a blessing God. He's a good, good father. Revelation, and also Ron is going to be driving the bus tonight. Tonight at 5 o'clock, last announcement, last commercial. Tonight at 5 o'clock, I'm preaching to Bishop Fred Browns at Faith Center in Bluefield, West Virginia at 5. And what Brother Ron is going to do for me and for the church is he's going to be here, leaving here at 4 o'clock if you want to ride on the bus, the church fam, to get there. And if you know how to get there and you want to just come on your own, please come. Y'all know how many times Bishop Fred has blessed this church, how many times he's brought his church on down. We're celebrating his anniversary, and I would like us to show him some love from City on the Hill. And plus, I'll preach better if I see your smiling faces there. So tonight at 5 o'clock, and Ron, thank you so much for offering to drive that bus. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. The only verse I'm going to read this morning. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. He said, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. That no man take thy crown. Hear the Lord Jesus said, What I've given you, cling to. And make sure that nobody takes it from you which implies that there are things in life that I will go through that will try to take off of me some blessings that God put in me. I want to preach a little while today to hold on to your crown. Hold on to your crown. Look at your neighbor and say, hold on to your crown. I have before you today a crown. I'm going to sit it on my pulpit, and every now and then I'm going to sit it on somebody's head probably that looks like they won't get mad if I mess up their hair. But this crown that I have, God said in the book of Revelation that he has given every man that believes in him, every woman, boy, and girl that believes in him, there's a crown. In the spiritual realm, as I preach to you, if I could see you in the spirit, you are all crowned with something that sets you apart. You are all crowned with something that makes you different. It was David that looked up into heaven in Psalms chapter 8, verse 5, and he said, Lord, what is man that you're even mindful of him? David said, I don't understand why we're so special to you, Lord. We fail and we struggle. We forget you. We turn our back on you in the good times. And we curse you many times during the hard times. What is it about man that you not only put up with us, but you bless us? You not only just tolerate us, but God, you celebrate it. What is it about us that you see as special? And it was at that moment that God began to reveal to David how special man truly is in the eyes of God. See, the reason many of you struggle with your self-concept, and if you struggle inwardly, it will always manifest outwardly. The reason you struggle is you've never seen how precious you are to God. In fact, many of you, if I could hear your heart of hearts speak, you would say, Pastor, I'm pretty sure I don't mean much to God. I'm pretty sure after all my mistakes and my failures, my weaknesses, my flaws and my shortcomings, I have a hard time believing that the God of heaven would see anything special in me. I've come to tell you that's one of the number one lies that keeps people in a mediocre life. It's one of the number one lives that keeps people in depression and in bondage. When you believe you're worthless, you will act worthless. When you believe there's nothing special about you, you will never accomplish anything special in life. And David peered up into heaven and he said, what is it about mankind that you love? And God began to express the truth to David. 
one of the greatest revelations to ever be revealed in the Word of God. He said, when I created man, I made him a little lower, uh, King James says, than the angels. Because when the King James interpreters were interpreting the Bible, when they saw what it really said, they were afraid to say it. See, sometimes we're afraid to tell people how good our God really is. Sometimes we're afraid to tell people how much we really matter to God. The word they translated angels in King James is the word Elohim. And Elohim means God. God said, when I made man, I made him a little lower than myself. He is more special to me than any other created thing because he is my prized possession. He is my creation. He is created in my image and in my likeness. I love man like I love no other. King James interpreters said that he made man a little lower than the angels and for centuries until Martin Luther and the Reformation, people begin to walk around the planet thinking that God loved the angels more than he loved man. But I submit to you God never made a plan of redemption for the angels. God never sent his son for the angels. God never redeemed Lucifer. God never worried about Michael and Gabriel. But when it came to you, heaven rolled up their sleeves and said, I'll send my only begotten son to redeem them. That tells me not that you're worthless. That tells me that you're his prized possession. Because if the God of glory would give the best heaven's God for you, that means you're valuable. That means when God looks at you, he sees something that perhaps you've not even seen. He placed something in you that you've not even known or recognized yet. The Bible said when he created man, he made him a little lower than Elohim. And he crowned him with glory and with honor. Here is something that the enemy has robbed us of. That religious teaching has robbed us of. That the Bible tells us repeatedly time and time again. The Bible said you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen generation, a peculiar people. The Bible declared time and time again that you were sons and daughters of the Most High, that you were kings and priests on planet Earth. When the Bible described you, it gives the imagery of royalty. And if you understand anything about royalty, you understand that they put a crown on royalty. The Bible said that when God made man, he crowned him with glory and with honor, you're going to hear me in a minute, when God breathed his breath into you, when you got born again, there was a crown placed on you in the spirit with only your name on it. That crown sets you apart. If you were to go to countries that have royalty and you were to see somebody that had the audacity to wear a crown, that crown would remind everyone around them that they were not mediocre that they were not average, that they were not ordinary. That crown is a reminder that they are special and they are set apart. God wants me to remind somebody that no matter what you're going through, you are special and you are set apart. The crown is a reminder that you belong to the king. See, there's a crown of glory and honor that God put on your head that reminds the enemy every morning when you wake up, I can't have that one. They belong to the king. It reminds the adversity that will come against you. I can't overtake that one. They're crowned with glory and honor. As I preach to you, if God would illuminate you by the Spirit, you could see that on top of your heads, there's a crown of glory and honor. When Dave went in for his PET scan diagnosis, he went in looking natural. But if you could see in the spirit, there was a crown on his head that said, my king has set me free. And the only reason you're here today is there was a king that crowned you with something that set you apart. I'm building a foundation today, but a crown is a reminder of royalty. A crown of glory and honor that God put on you that said you can do different than other people. You can accomplish more than average. You can reach heights that nobody around you has ever reached if you will walk in the authority and the power of that crown. One of the greatest tragedies in the church today is we walk so far below what the crown declares we can have.
We live a life so far below what the blood of Jesus was shed to give us. And now we live in a time where people are hurting and people are struggling and people aren't walking in the authority that the crown God gave them represents. There's a crown that God put on your head that represents there's authority in your prayer. Somebody's going to get this right now. See, when I come to God, I don't come to God as a beggar. I come to God with a crown upon my head. And that crown upon my head is a sign unto God that Barry Absher belongs unto me. So when he prays, his prayer has privilege. His prayer bypasses other prayers because he's a child of the Most High God. You can put a mother in a room with a hundred screaming kids and blindfold her. But the moment when her children begins to scream, say she has one kid in there with a hundred other kids and her child begins to scream. Did you know that mother can identify the cry of her child? Because that's her baby. Somebody's going to hear me in a minute. When you begin to cry out to your heavenly father, there's an identification number on your prayer because you're part of his kingdom. And it bypasses the Muslim prayer. It bypasses the Buddhist prayer. And it reaches the throne room. You ought to give God a praise if you know. He'll answer you when you pray. Your prayer will move heaven. Your prayer will drive back cancer. Your prayer will lift depression. The enemy don't want you to know that there's a crown on your head. There's a crown on your head that makes your prayer matter. I'm going to need somebody. Jesse, come up here for me. You ain't got enough hair for it to mess up. <laughs> we can see in the spirit. Jesse has a crown that the enemy can see. This crown of glory and honor that God put on him when he got saved, it gives him the permission to do things he couldn't do before Jesus. It gives him the liberty to not be bound by any mistake of his past. The crown declares that nothing he did before he got saved has permission to destroy his future. The crown you have it declares that nothing you did in your past can destroy your future. I need somebody to give God a praise for the power of the crown that sits on your head. This crown of glory and honor, it declares that when Jesse has a need in his family, he can bring it like a royal priesthood before the throne of God, and God will hear him. Do you see why hell would fight this message? Because hell don't want you to know that in the spirit there's a crown on your head. There's some, a blessing God put on your life that separates you from everybody else. There's a crown that sits on your head, a crown of glory and a crown of honor. But Jesus said, beware lest any man take your crown, which tells me in life there will always be somebody or something trying to strip away my crown. And I believe many times the reason we're walking powerless is we're preaching to a kingdom that has lost their crowns. They've let discouragement and depression and the tongues of people make them take off the blessing that the blood of Jesus put on them. Jesus said, beware lest any man take your crown. I've seen people wear the crown, and the minute somebody starts talking about them, they take it off. The minute adversity comes, they take it off. The minute struggle comes, they take it off. There will always be pressure for you to take off what God put on you. There was a little boy. He wanted to play baseball. He was, in fact, a phenomenal baseball player. And he felt like in his heart, <coughs> he felt like in his heart that God had given him a gift to play baseball. The problem was he was about this tall, and he was in high school, and when he went out for baseball tryouts, he was a great little league baseball player, a great uh, mid, uh, middle school baseball player. But when he got to his freshman year of high school and he went out for baseball tryouts at a school in Florida, the coach looked at him and said, you'll never make the team. You're too short. He hit the ball. He caught the ball. He did phenomenal in practice. But the coach couldn't get over how he looked and said, young man, I'm sorry, but you're too small to play baseball. It was at that moment that young man, he felt like taking off his crown. He felt like saying, well, maybe you're right. There'll always be people that go by what they see and try to disqualify you from what God said. But the young man, he goes home disappointed, but he finds out the next day at school that because so many kids had come out for baseball, this large school was going to have an A team and they were going to have a B team. 
And the A team was made up of all the good kids that the coach liked that could play baseball. And the B team was made up of the lesser kids that he didn't feel like were good enough, but he was still, because there were so many, he was going to go ahead and give them a B team. They called the little boy and said, we're going to let you play on the B team. And the thing was, the A team and the B team for the same school were competing in the same league. Kept winning game after game, uh, championship matches, and all of a sudden they enter the playoffs. And the A team keeps winning for the same school. And the B teams keep winning. The greater team and the lesser team keep winning ball games until finally they're the only two teams left. And first time in state history, two teams from the same school had to play each other. The A team had to play the B team. The greater team had to play the lesser team. And guess who was pitching for the lesser team? The little boy that they said wasn't good enough to play on the greater team. And he pitched a no-hitter, and the B team beat the A team, all because he didn't let his coach talk him out of his crown. Oh, I come to tell some, don't lay your crown down for nobody. Don't quit being who you are. Don't give up on what God said. I need somebody to give God a praise if you're going to hold on to your crown. Don't lay down your crown just because somebody's talking about you. Don't lay down your crown every time adversity hits. Jesus said, beware lest any man take your crown. He didn't even say the devil. He said, there'll be men that'll try to say, you're not worthy of that crown, Jason. There'll be people all through life that'll try to talk you out of the blessing that God. The reason they don't get behind it like you do is they've not felt what you feel. Because what God put in you, he didn't put in them. That's why they don't understand it. So many times we look for confirmation of our crown in people, and people ain't good at giving us a confirmation of a crown, but I'm reminded every day that I'm wearing a crown of glory and of honor. Every time I get into the presence of God, I'm reminded that I'm wearing a crown of glory and a crown of honor. See, and when you come to church, I'm not going to knock your crown off your head. We got too many churches in America that instead of helping people retain their crown, they go ahead and kick them when they're down and throw away their crown. The church is the only organization in the world that doesn't have a recovery plan. The church is the the only organization in the world that buries its wounded. See, you might have come in here this morning with your crown about half sideways. Somebody might have tarnished your crown. God didn't send me here to go ahead and knock your crown off and tell you God's finished with you. God sent me here to straighten your crown up and polish it up and remind you that you are who God says you are. And you have what God says you have. And you, I wish somebody would give God a praise of royalty. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hell hates this message because this message empowers you. But there are churches all across America that will leave with the crown knocked off. Not by the devil, not by evil forces, but by religious preachers that told them they weren't worthy. That talked them out of what they were believing for rather than encouraged them to see that thing through that God had put in their heart. Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. You see, I don't care what they say about you. It's only what you respond to that matters. And when you know who you are, it doesn't matter who they say you are. But so many times, we don't listen to the command of Jesus. First time of adversity. See, I can't put it on my head. Carlene's making me take pictures after church. And I can't mess up my hair. Got to keep looking like Elvis. It? But so many times when adversity comes, we hand over our crowd. Somebody don't like you. You hand them the crown. Somebody quit believing in you. You hand them the crown. People come against you. You hand them the crown. You get a bad report and you hand them the crown. Jesus said, beware lest any man take your crown. Which lets me know that in life there will always be men and people that will try to take from me what God's given me. They'll try to get me to quit believing that I'm special to God. They'll try to get, get me to quit believing that God can do something in my life. So many times we let the situations that we're going through take away what God's doing in us. Do you remember when Esau walked into the tent and his father Isaac looked at him and he said, Jacob has taken away your blessing. I've come to ask you today, who was it that you let take your crown? What mistake did you hand your crown over to and say, I'm not worthy anymore? What struggle have you taken off your crown 
and quit praying with the fervency that you used to pray all because opposition's coming. Jesus warned you that there would be voices that would try to talk you out of your crown tray, Chase. There would be people that would try to talk you out of your dream. And the tragedy is, it's at those moments we need to hold on to more than ever the crown that God has set on our head. But it's at those moments that we are tempted more than ever to lay down the blessing that God has on us. I've just come to tell somebody today that's laid down your crown. God did not bring you in here to bury you. God brought you in here to give you the faith to pick up that that you lay down and say, Devil, I'm going to wear my crown again. I might have done what you said I did, but I ain't who you said I am. I dare you to put your crown back on because if man they talk you out of it but man ultimately cannot take it from you because that that's reserved for you is yours and not another the reason many people get jealous of your crown is because they've never seen their crown and when you realize who you are in God you don't have to be jealous of who somebody else is in God when you realize you're special to God you can rejoice when somebody else is special to God but the tragedy is so many people don't realize how special they are to God I feel the Holy Ghost in here y'all because David once that crown was placed on his head the one thing I never can find in scripture that he did Donetta I never can find where he took it off nowhere in scripture can I find where David said all right I give up the crown that God Almighty gave me when Saul uh, when the people still pulled for Saul even after Saul's death and talked about David David kept wearing his crown when he had to battle the Philistines in 2 Samuel chapter 5 when they heard he had the crown on he kept his crown on and didn't hand it over to the Philistines when opposition inside his own house come against him he kept wearing his crown I'm about to preach to somebody because even after his greatest mistake the one thing David never gave up on was the crown that God put in his head because somewhere in David he said I know God ain't giving up on me and if God hasn't given up on me I'm not going I, I just come to tell somebody God hasn't given up on you you ought to praise him right now he still loves you he's still behind you he'll still fight hell on your behalf Beware, lest any man take thy crown. I had teachers at an early age try to take my crown. Tell me I was never going to do this, never going to do that. Have voices. Try to, because here's the thing about the enemy. He don't wait till you get there to try to mess with you. He'll fight with you on the way. Am I right about it? He'll try to talk you out of ever being. He'll try to break your spirit before you ever get saved. He'll try to make you believe lies about yourself before you ever get here because he knows that once you get here, God's going to set a crown upon your head that's been reserved for you from the foundations of the world. The Bible talks about a woman named Naomi. And Naomi was somebody that was born into the royal kingdom of Bethlehem, Judah. Her name meant grace. Her name meant joy. But there came a hard time in Judah because I don't care how blessed something is, it'll always be challenged from time to time. And instead of her hanging through the tough time, her husband took her and his two sons out of Bethlehem, Judah, which means house of bread and house of praise. Let me help somebody. When times are tough, that's not the time to leave church. That's the time to say, I'm coming no matter what. Because some of the greatest blessings I've ever got in the house of God is or when everything in me told me to stay home. But I came anyway. That's why the Bible called it the sacrifice of praise. If you only praise it when you feel like it, it don't mean much. But have you ever had to praise God with tears streaming down your face? Have you ever had to praise God when you have multiple voices saying, go ahead, take off your crown. Give up on what God told you. But you came anyhow. Naomi left Bethlehem, Judah with her husband. And before it was over, her husband died and her two children died because they had settled in a place named Moab. Moab was the place that never changed. Be careful for wanting the place that never changed. 
The reason a lot of people are dying in church today and losing their crowns is this. They, they're going to a church that never changes. You know when they're going to stand up. You know when they're going to sit down. And the last person they're going to let move is the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you, but sometimes I like to go to church and God just blow my mind. Sometimes I like to go to church and say, wow, I didn't see that one. I didn't know that one was going to get healed. I didn't know that one was going to get saved. I didn't know the altars were going to flood during the praise and worship. Some Somebody give God a praise if you don't want to live in Moab. I like it when God surprises me. And see, when you're wearing your crown, you're setting up the stage for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to come and surprise you, to come and bless you. And now Naomi's been through a tough life because she's lost her husband and her two sons. And her daughter-in-laws are with her. And then the one daughter-in-law, Orpha, leaves. And Naomi, uh, Ruth says, I'll stay. She said, I'll stay, Naomi. And Naomi said, don't call me Naomi, because that means joy. She said, from now on, you call me Mara. You call me bitter. So many times, we change our identity because of what we're going through. I don't worry about people when they're going through a storm. I worry about people when the storm gets in them. I've seen people go through a storm, and as long as they keep their crown on, they're okay, Nancy. As long as they keep realizing they're precious to God and that God will not fail them, they always make it. But here's when I worry. When the storm rages a long time and begins to make them let a man take their crown. Let a circumstance take their crown. And then I realize that the storm that was around them has somehow got in them. What did David pray? He said, God, cover my head in the day of battle. Because when you're going through a battle, your head will tell you, you ain't got a crown on you, John. God's removed his favor, Jerry. God's removed his glory from your life. It's at those moments you've got to remind yourself, I may be going through battles, but I'm still wearing a crown. I may not have everything I think I wanted right now, but I'm still special to God, and I will get there. I know I did it a few services ago, but I'm going to do it right now. Um, Jason, stand up for me again. Jason, Jason one, Jason two, both Jasons. Give both Jasons a hand. Face the, face the people. Now, I want you to understand. See, when God saved me, this is where I was. Pretend this is buried when I got saved. God set a crown on my head. Carly, we'll just have to fix my hair again. I won't, I won't do hound dog this morning, baby. And God started with me here addicted, depressed, suicidal. You can ask my brother. I was messed up. But God took me anyway, and he set a crown on me. He said, Barry, you're different. And then he pointed me, and he said, if you'll follow me, that's where you'll be. You'll be free of those things that hinder you now. I'll use you, and I'll make you a man of God. And I began my journey. It's still messed up, still struggling, but there was a crown on my head. But I, I started going that way, and I saw it like Abraham saw the offering afar off. Have you ever seen the promises of God, but it seemed a long way off from where you are right now? And you said, God, I don't know how I'll get there or if I'll get there in time, but you just kept on going in that direction little by little. I, I, you don't get saved one day in terms into Billy Graham the next. But I found that my God works with you little by little and bit by bit. So I just kept on and I just kept on and I'd pray a little here and I'd cry a little there and I'd see God answer a prayer over here and I'd see God make a miracle over there. Then I'd go through a hard spell and I'd seem to stall out but I'd just keep praising and somehow God would move me through little by little and bit by bit and I would just keep holding on to my crown. People would say you ain't got it. People would say you ain't called to preach. If I had a nickel for every person that had tried to get me to hand over my crown, I'd have a lot of nickels right now. But I just kept wearing my crown. I'm preaching good to somebody because God said that's where I'm going to get to one day. The problem is one day I realize I've been serving God for two decades, Raymond, and I still got a long way to go. I can't get no honest Christians in here. If you'd be honest, have you ever had the devil step into the gap and show you you're still a long way off from what God put in your heart? 
And you ain't got the time you used to have. And you ain't never going to get there. Look how long the gap is, Barry. And little by little you're trying. And little by little, but you're 44. And the gap is still a long way off. And sometimes it feels like you've stalled out. And the enemy, he'll show me this gap. But can I tell you that what you see before you, there are two gaps. There's also a gap behind me that the Holy Ghost will show me. And he'll say, Barry, you may not be where you should be. But look how far I brought you. You ain't where you used to be. I wish had somebody that would praise God that yay you've come too far to turn back now you've come too far to lay down now don't hand your crown over she said don't call me Naomi anymore she said because life has changed my name's Mara and I'm bitter have you ever seen somebody that was so sweet in one season but they'd been through some battles and they'd turn bitter. They'd turn cold. They didn't praise God like they used to praise God. They didn't reach for God like they used to reach for God. And it breaks your heart when you see somebody take off the crown. It breaks your heart when you see somebody lay down the promise that God has for them. And Naomi said, you ain't calling me Naomi no more. From now on, my name is Mara. I'm bitter. But when she came back to the kingdom because she heard God was blessing it again, everybody saw her and they said, well, look who it is. It's old Naomi. And every time they'd say Naomi, they were saying joy. They were saying grace. And she would say, don't you call me Naomi. I've been through some stuff. That ain't my name no more. But they refused to ever call her by what she had been through. They kept calling her Naomi, which means every time they spoke her name, they were prophesying what God was going to do in her life. Ah, oh, I wish the church would be like that. They might have left for a season. They might have got addicted and struggled but the once they come through those doors we don't call them what they've been through we remind them of who they are and one day the blessing will come again the problem with too many churches is we let people's problems change the way we see them and our challenge is to still see them wearing the crown our challenge is to remind them that no matter how many people are against them and how much opposition they're facing, there's a crown with their name on it that they don't need to take off for anybody. I've come today to remind you of the crown that God Almighty has for your head. It reminds me of the story of Helen of Troy. How many of you have ever read that book, Helen of Troy? You've heard the story, Helen of Troy. The thing about Helen of Troy was she was a young, beautiful queen in a beautiful, beautiful kingdom. But one day, hostile people, invaders, invaded the kingdom, and they snatched her up. And the trauma of their invasion caused this young, beautiful teenage queen to forget who she was. And when she woke up in the strange kingdom, she woke up with amnesia. And they didn't tell her she was a queen. They didn't remind her that she was royalty. They made her believe she was nothing but a peasant and a beggar. <coughs> they made her believe that she was a nobody. And she lived for years under an assumed identity that her life wasn't different and all she was was a beggar. We got too many people in church that done forgot who they are. And they're living under an assumed identity. They're not living as king's kids. They're living as beggars and paupers just begging for a little crumb when God says, I want to give you above, press down, shake it together, and run it over anything that you could ever ask or believe. I've, I've got a Bible that tells me God wants to bless his children. But if you live under an assumed identity, if you've forgotten the crown with your name on it, you've handed it over, then you're in a stuck place. And for years, she would, she would drink out of nasty fountains. She would beg for mercy from people that would give her no mercy. But there was this man that had raised her in the kingdom. He had been given charge over her since she was a little girl, and he loved her as his own daughter. And nobody in the kingdom ever gave up on her. And this man went out, and he looked for her city after city, town after town. For years, he looked for the queen to see her beautiful face and bring her back into the kingdom. And he went town to town, gutter to gutter. And everybody else would have given up, but this man wouldn't give up because he loved her from the time she was a child. He was her caregiver. He was her protector. He was her chaperone. Until one day he comes to a strange city full of mean, vile people. And as he's walking the gutters, he sees a woman bowed over, drinking out of a little creek. And he sees something that kind of looks familiar, but it's so decimated, so messed up. 
And he says, ma'am, tell me your name. And the woman never looked up. She just kept drinking and mumbled. Remember? Mumbled. And he got ready to walk off, but there was something that made him just say, there's something about her. I, I got to take a closer look. And this man, from the time this girl had been little, had studied her hands. She had very unique hand lines that he loved, and he would always rub the hand lines, and he knew her hands. They were precious to him. And he walked up to this mumbling beggar, and he said, Lady, show me your hands. And with trembling hands, she held her hands up to the man. And the moment he touched her hands, he realized who she was. He looked at her, and he said, You are not a beggar. You are Queen Helen. And the moment his voice spoke to her who she was, she remembered and she came up out of the gutter and he took her home. I'm about to preach to somebody right now. When you hear God through the power of the Holy Ghost, who's been looking for you in the gutter, remind you of who you are. You'll say, I don't have to live in depression anymore. I don't have to live in fear anymore. I don't have to live in jaw somebody. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost will bring all things to their remembrance. How many of you have ever experienced deja vu? You've, you've been somewhere and you've been like, my God, I, I've been here before. it make you think you're crazy. That would happen to me a lot even when I was preaching, Kay. I'd be preaching and I would think, wait, I've done this before. You ever walked in a place and you think, I've been here before. You know why? Because you have been. Because God put that in the spirit in you when you were with him before he sent you to the earth. But when you were born, you went through the trauma of being birthed into this planet and you forgot what God told you. But that's why the Bible said the Holy Ghost will bring all things to your remembrance. See, for 19 years I lived thinking I was a nobody and I would never get over my struggles. But when I came to that altar, I heard God speak and I began to remember, hey, I'm not supposed to be crazy. I'm supposed to be a preacher. I'm not supposed to be depressed. God has a call on my, and I put my crown back on, and it's been over two decades, but I'm not going to hand it over. I'm not going to give up on what God said. Am I talking to anybody that says I'm going to hold on to my crown? I'm going to hold on to my blessing. I dare you to stand to your feet and give the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords Let me drop a little revelation on you. If he's the king, singular, of kings, plural, who are the kings? The Bible told you who the kings were. You're the kings and the priests. And the only place in Scripture we're ever instructed to cast their crown is when we get to heaven. The Bible says we will lay them at the feet of Jesus and we will give him the praise the glory and the honor, because we will know we were nothing without him. And everything we have is because of our King, our Lord, and our Savior. And we will say, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Can I tell you he's worthy? I received a lot of compliments yesterday that blessed my heart. And listen, when somebody compliments you, don't be rude. Say thank you. I, I was telling a young person the other day, they did a good job, and they go, that was God, wasn't me, like I was some jerk. Just say thank you. That's what you do. Let me help some of you young preachers. Have some sense. Say thank you. And then give God the glory. But I had this one guy walk up to me, and he said, hey, it was after the funeral, and he grabbed my hand, Amy, and he said, Jesus himself couldn't have done a better job. Only time I've ever had to rebuke a compliment. I said, sir, Jesus is the one that carried me through that. What was I doing? I was saying, I wouldn't have this crown if it wasn't for my king. I wouldn't have what I have if it wasn't for Jesus. I wouldn't be married to the woman I'm married to and have the two kids I have. I wouldn't even be in my right mind. Honey, I'd be in some mental institute going crazy. So I will always take this crown and lay it before the crown of my king. Because for every good thing I have, come on, lift those hands to the king. The king of kings. The Lord of Lords.
My flesh couldn't have preached that funeral yesterday because that was a woman I loved, married to a man that I loved, some of our best friends for 20 years. But my king carried me. There are times life will try to take your crown off, but the king that gave you the crown will help you carry it. He'll help you wear it. Some of you, life has tried to talk you out of your crown. Life has tried to take you. And you've been living under an assumed identity for a long time now. Let me ask you a question. Who took your crown? What discouragement did you hand your crown over to? What problem did you say, all right, I give it to you? Because in life, there'll always be somebody waiting to take your crown crown of glory and honor. I want everybody to stand to your feet and those that are going to be baptized, go ahead and go to the restrooms. There's dressing areas there and go ahead and prepare. Behold, I have brought you here today, for you are living uncovered. You have taken my crown of glory and honor and handed it to your pain. You have changed the way you see yourself, and thus you have changed the way other people have seen you. You have believed the lies concerning your pain and declared that you are unworthy of the crown that I set upon you. But behold, the blood of my son is what qualified you. I say unto you, do not leave this house uncovered. Do not leave this house unclothed. Put on the royal garments that were purchased for you. Put on the crown of honor and glory. I hear the Lord saying, quit expecting the bottom to fall out. That means something to somebody right now. God is saying to somebody, quit expecting the bottom to fall out. When you're wearing your crown, you ain't looking for it to get worse. You're looking for it to get better. You're not expecting the world to curse you. You're expecting your king to bless you. And God has brought you here today because life has knocked off your crown. You've taken it off and you've handed it to pain to worry, to discouragement. In the name of Jesus, pick that crown up. If that's you, and you say, Pastor, I'm going through some things, and I've let the enemy get in me, my, in my mind, and I've, I've, I've about quit believing God has anything for me, and nobody can see it, but I'm so discouraged, I didn't even feel like coming. But the Holy Ghost has talked to me this morning, and I'm going to pick my crown back up. I need God to do something for me. I dare you to wave at me right now. I dare you to wave at me. I see those hands. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you all over this place. God bless you. God bless you. I want everybody that raised that hand, I want you to act like a king's kid right now, and I want you to march up here to this altar because God's going to allow you by grace to pick up everything life's trying to knock off of. I dare you to give them a hand clap right now. I dare you to let them know you've been where they are. God bless you. God bless you, sis. God bless you, j -Bo. God bless you. Come on, others, right now. This precious lady that they met on door to door came today, and here she is. Thank you, Summer, and thank you, J Bo, for going door to door. Others, come right now, right now, right now. There's a crown with your name on it. The enemy would love you to leave this service feeling like a beggar, feeling like a pauper, feeling like you don't matter. But God has a crown. You're not to be named by your mistakes. No matter how great they are, no matter how many they are, this crown has nothing to do with where you've been. This crown has everything to do with where you're going. With every head bowed, every eye closed, and no one looking but me. Children of God that need to come, come. If you're being saved up here, some of you that are up here, if you're asking the Lord into your heart, please let us know because we want to love on you. But if you're back there and life has told you God ain't got no crown for you, God don't want to do nothing in your life, because you've made too many mistakes. You've got too many struggles. The devil is a liar. And God brought you here today not to beat you up, but he even sent a tongue and interpretation to let the power of the Spirit of God be felt. 
If you're in here and you say, I need to be saved, I want to give my heart to the Lord. Would you lift that hand to where I can see it right now? I'm looking for you. You might have been where I was all them years ago. When God got a hold of me, I was a long way from ever being a preacher. If that's you, would you lift your hand right now? I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you. All over this place, I'm looking for somebody that will raise that hand and say, I want to change kingdoms. I want to come into the kingdom of God. I want God to be my father. I want heaven to be my home. I want Jesus to be my savior. Would you lift that hand right now? I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you. This altar is open as we pray. Worship the Lord as they sing.